I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Before we read this passage, I want to say a couple things about it. This is probably the most controversial parable that Jesus ever gave um, that is you know, recorded in God's Word. A lot of sermons have been preached by a lot of very good um, preachers from this parable. I am of the opinion that every parable has one to be learned and if you get very far away from that lesson uh, you're entering into dangerous territory because you're not preaching God's word anymore you're preaching whatever you want to preach so um, just be aware that this is a this is a difficult parable to to really understand I believe that this parable of the dishonest manager has one lesson, and it's this, that Jesus was praising this man's shrewdness, his shrewdness. Now, being shrewd is not a sin. Um, God tells us we need to be shrewd individuals, especially when we're dealing with the world, you know, people in the world, okay? Now, you can go too far in being shrewd, and slip into sinfulness, okay? But we want to recognize that, at least I'm suggesting to you today, that Jesus was praising this man's shrewdness, and that's the lesson we need to learn today. And there's four lessons out of this man's shrewdness that I want to share with you this morning. Luke chapter 16, 1 through 9 Follow with me in your copy of God's word. Now he said to his disciples, so let me just point out right there, he's talking to the church. He's talking to his followers, okay? There was a rich man who received <clears throat> an accusation that his manager was squandering his possessions. So he called the manager in and asked, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can can no longer be my manager. And then the manager said to himself, what will I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I'm removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. So he summoned each of the master's debtors. How much do you owe my master? He asked the first one. A hundred measures of olive oil, he said. Take your invoice, he told him. Sit down quickly and write 50. Next, he said to another, how much do you owe? A hundred measures of wheat, he said. Take your invoice, he said, and write 80. The master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd than the children of light in dealing with their own people. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of worldly wealth, so that when it fails, they may welcome you into eternal dwellings. May God always bless the reading of his word. Exactly where this parable ends is a little bit awkward and a little bit uncertain. I ended in verse 9 because I believe once you get into verse 10, Jesus makes a little shift in his lessons. He begins to talk about money management. Okay, Now there's a little bit of money management of what this shrewd ma you know, manager does, but again, that's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is his shrewdness. So I chose to end the parable at verse 9, okay? Um, you guys may remember the names Shepera and um, Pua, but you might not remember what they did. Unless you're an Old Testament scholar, those names might have slid right past you. 
These are the two ladies in Exodus chapter 1 who were the midwives. And if you don't remember the story, let me refresh your memory for just a moment. Um, in Exodus chapter 1, a new king arises in Egypt. Now, we, turn, we use the term king, you know, got King Charles over in England, but it's, it's Pharaoh. King and Pharaoh, basically the same idea. The Pharaoh's, though, the king in, in Egypt, all right? So he arises, and he does not know Joseph. But he, he looks out, and he sees that the number of Hebrew people are increasing in Egypt, and he becomes worried that they might side with the enemy, or maybe even themselves revolt, and um, overthrow Egypt. So what he does is he... He acts shrewdly. He calls the people, or calls his managers together, and he says, I want you to slowly begin to increase the workload of the Israelites. And, you know, make them make bricks. Make them, you know, create, you know, or bring in the, the hay in order to make the bricks and slowly increase that number. And before too long, they were actually enslaved by the Egyptians, talking about the Hebrew people. All right? Listen to what Exodus 1, verses 9 and 10 says. All right? This is the, the king speaking. He says, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than, than we are. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them. Otherwise, they will multiply further, and when war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. I think it's very interesting that that verse right there says the king or Pharaoh is acting shrewdly, okay? The very next story in chapter 1 of the book of Exodus is the story of these two midwives. And if you remember what the king does, he tells the midwives, when a girl is born to the Hebrew people, let her live. But if it's a boy, kill him. Now, the midwives feared God. They didn't want to do that. So what they did is they acted shrewdly, and they were slow in getting to a woman who was in labor. And when, she, when they arrived, the baby would have already been born, and if it was a boy, it, it's already alive. They're, they're not going to put it down, not going to kill the baby. So I just want to point this out, that this idea of shrewdness is found throughout the scriptures, okay? And these two women, Shapira and Pua, acted shrewdly in their, um, ob their obedience to God. Now, this dishonest manager in our parable today acted shrewdly also. Sometimes acting shrewdly can lead us into sin, but it's not necessarily sinful in itself. Each situation's got to be judged in its own merit, okay? Jesus would never um, compliment somebody's sinfulness. That's just not going to happen in the scriptures. So in, in praising this dishonest manager's shrewdness Jesus is is complimenting something that he he's done so there's there's four things that I want you to see out of this this parable and the first is the dishonest manager's clear thinking his clear thinking okay now the owner of the land was um, he had he's heard this report that his manager is not doing a good job. Parable doesn't tell us what's happening in detail. Maybe he's swindling. Maybe he's whatever. But he calls the dis manager, or dishonest manager in and says, you've got to give me an, under, you know, an account of your, your management because you're, you're not going to be able to stay here any longer. Okay, you, You've been cheating me. I figured that out. So in that moment... That dishonest manager make, has to make a decision. What is he going to do in the future? What is he going to do tomorrow? What's he going to do in the coming weeks? Because he's about to lose his job. 
And so he comes up with this plan. And he, he calls in uh, some of the debtors, the people who owe the owner money. And he reduces their pay or, or their bill. And what that's going to do is that's going to make them happy with the manager so that when he's out of a job, they're going to say, hey, you were nice to me. Yeah, come on over for dinner. You know, come on over, spend the night with me, okay? Think about it this. Our culture today is struggling with clear thinking. That's a, this is a real problem in our country today. It's true, sadly, in the church as well as outside the church. We're all having trouble with clear thinking. Let me give you a couple examples that can kind of steer you in where I'm going here for a few minutes this morning. Number one, if there is no God, all right, that statement right there, I know it's not a full grammatical statement, but it says if there is no God, it's either true or false. If there is no God, what does that mean for you and me, other than the fact we're wasting our time on Sunday mornings? If there is no God, then you and I ultimately are accountable to only ourselves. Because there's nobody else higher that's going to judge us and hold us accountable at various points in this life and in, um, in the judgment to come. So ultimately, you can do whatever you want if there is no God. However, what if there is a God? Okay? If there is a God, then you and I are ultimately accountable to him. We will one day be held accountable to God and, and have to explain to him why we did what we did. Why did we stay home on Sunday morning? Why did we not minister to somebody when God gave us an opportunity? If there is a God, then we should govern our lives in such a way as to try to know him and to try to live our lives in a manner that is pleasing to God. Because we recognize that one day we're going to be accountable to him. Here's another thought. Jesus is just a religious leader. He's just another religious leader you know, you got Muhammad, and you've got Buddha, and you've got Krishna, and there's Jesus, and there's Joseph Smith, and there's all sorts of other people out there. And if this is a true statement, then it really doesn't matter if you follow Jesus' teachings or not, because they're just one teaching among many other worldly teachings. But if Jesus is God... This is the fourth point here, folks. Then Jesus' teachings are of eternal value. His instructions on life and salvation are the highest form of teaching, the highest lesson that we could have. In fact, Jesus' instructions on how to get into heaven and how to avoid hell are the most important lessons you could ever learn. One, one more thought here. What if heaven and hell are real? Have you ever thought about that? Again, this is, can be either a true statement or a false statement. If, there, if it's a false statement that there is no heaven, if there is no hell, then live your life however you want to. Quit wasting your time on Sunday mornings coming to hear me talk. Go out and party. Have a fun time. Pursue whatever you're pleasure in life you want however if it's true if there is a heaven if there is a hell then folks we better figure out how to get into heaven and how to avoid hell see my point in just sharing these things with you is that we're not thinking clearly as americans we're not thinking clearly even as Christians because the church is not pursuing God with everything that we have in us. If he is real, if heaven is real, why are we not more focused and more 
directed in what we're trying to do. Y'all remember the story of Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal? It was a time in Israel when there were you know, very few people openly following God. But the prophet Elijah, perhaps one of their greatest prophets, even though he didn't write a, one of the books in the, in the Bible, he's led by God to challenge the 450 prophets of Baal. Here's what he does. He, he calls them to the mountaintop and he says, we're going to each build an altar and we're going to kill a, a cow and put it on the altar and we're going to, to call on God to light the fire. You guys go first. So the 450 prophets of Baal, they build their altar and they put their wood on the altar and then they kill the cow and they put him on the, on the fire and they begin chanting for their God to, to pour down fire from heaven. They, they cut themselves. They're, they're dancing and screaming and shouting and praying and doing everything that they can. And I love the story of Elijah begins to mock them. I think this is hysterical. Maybe not a good thing for us to follow as a lesson. But he says to him, you know, hey, did your God go on vacation? You know, chant louder. Maybe he's asleep. And after half a day, he says, all right, guys, it's my turn. So he's got his altar there. It's, you know, the wood's piled up. He kills the cow, puts it on there. And then he does something interesting. He says, bring water, pour it on the cow, pour it on the altar. And he does that three times to soak the wood. Now, if you've ever tried to light a fire with wet wood, it doesn't work too well. But then he steps back and he cries out to God, Lord God, pour out your fire. And, and it comes out of heaven and it hits the altar. The cows burned up, the altars burned up, the waters licked up. And then Elijah says this to the people. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And God has just demonstrated he's the real deal. There should be no wavering. In our thinking, we ought to follow the Lord God. Second way this dishonest manager is an example for us today is his concern for his future. His concern for his future. Now he's wise enough to understand that the owner is not going to change his mind. He's not going to be able to talk him into giving him another six weeks or six months or whatever. He's about to lose his job. All right? So he has to do something to provide for himself and for his family, to provide for his future. And his plan, as we have already seen, is that he's going to call in the, uh, the men, the debtors, to the owner. And he cuts down their um, bill so that they'll be happy with him and help him out here in a few days when he loses his job. Y'all remember the tests that we used to take in school? Now, I'm not talking about the pop quizzes. Those were bad enough. But the tests that we took in school, whether it be a midterm or a final, the professor would tell you, on this date, you will be tested. And here's the material you need to know in order to be prepared for the test. Now, you can go out and party and you can play and you can do whatever you want, want. But a wise student is going to budget his time as that date approaches so that when he sits down to take the test, he's ready to, to take it. Okay? When I was in, a student at Texas Tech, um, I discovered that the university could care less if I was in class or not. So on a pretty day like we've got today, I'd go out and throw a frisbee rather than take, sitting in class taking notes. 
but I was a wise student in that I tried to figure out as quickly as I could who the best students were. And normally it would be one of the girls, and if she didn't have a boyfriend, I'd ask her out. I'm not dumb. And even if she did have a boyfriend, I would go to her and I would say, hey, can I borrow your notes from, you know, last week I was not in class, can I, you know, copy your notes down? And I would do that, and, and normally they would be gracious enough to let me do that. You were with us last Sunday. We looked at a different parable. We looked at the parable of the rich fool. And in that parable, Jesus says the following. You fool, this very night, your, your life is demanded of you. If we were to hear those words today, that tonight your life is demanded of you, would you be ready? Have you planned properly for your future? Will you meet Jesus as a friend or as an acquaintance? Would you be thrilled to enter heaven or would you struggle to leave behind things of this world? Would your soul be ready for eternity? See, as Christians, we know that one day when these bodies are no longer useful, we're going to lay them down and we're going to enter into God's presence. Have you planned for your future? Are you thinking about that moment when you see Jesus for the very first time? Will he say to you, glad that you're here? Or will he say to you, well done, my good and faithful friend? See, there's a difference. Have you ever noticed the cost of health care is going up? Of course, so is car repair. All right? So is home repair. I wrote that line, uh, like on Wednesday. Uh, last night before I got or went down into the basement, I discovered we had a water leak in, our, in the pipe in the ceiling of our basement. So guess what I get to deal with um, probably tomorrow. But even end-of-life obligations such as burial costs, funeral expenses, we all have to be wise in the planning of our future. And you would be smart to have insurance, health care insurance, car insurance, home repair insurance, whatever it might be, because there's going to be costs as you go down the road. Without health care, we would never have been able to afford Terry's surgery that she had um, on the 5th of July. By the way, she is improving. Thank you for your prayers. She's, she's, she's getting better. That's the, the main thing. Back in February, my car was violently attacked by some animal. Never did quite figure out what I hit, but I do know that it cost me about $1,200 to fix it. Okay? Can't afford those kind of bills too often. So you plan for your future. Third way, this dishonest manager is an example for us, is in his preparation to meet God. His preparation to meet God. The dishonest manager knew what was soon to happen to him. He's going to lose his job. If we put this in spiritual terms, we are soon going to meet with God. The manager took clear steps to help himself once he was out of work. And you and I would be wise to take steps today for that day when we will stand before God. We all know it's going to happen, but are we preparing for that day? Now, if you're not a Christian here today, you need to seek out Christian teaching because Christianity, more than any other of the world religions, has a good understanding of what it means to know God, what it means to go to meet God. 
And I would advise a non-Christian to start with Christianity in seeking out the future, especially in plans for, for meeting with God. Following our parable, Jesus makes some general statements about the use of money. And those begin, well, really in verse 9, but also following uh, that ver verse. I want to share a couple of things with you about um, his, his money management here, all right? First of all, he says, use your money for proper means, okay? In the parable of the sheep and the goats, which we will look at at the end, it'll be the last parable in this series that we'll get we'll get to it in about two years something like that I'm just kidding but in that parable what separated the sheep from the goats it was how they used their money the sheep used their money to bless other people to help them with food with clothing with shelter the goats didn't do that they kept their money in their pockets, ultimately, is what they did. And I believe what Jesus is saying here is that, and well, he says in verse 9, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of worldly wealth. All right? We should be using our finances to make friends with the lost world. Okay? What do I mean by that? Invite them to lunch, invite them to dinner, invite them over to your house. Use your money to make friends with people. Second, be faithful in small things and larger things will be entrusted to you. Okay? If you cannot be trusted in a little bit, why do you think you're going to be faithful if God suddenly gave you a lot? And I'm not just speaking of uh, money in that statement what if God gave you a little bit of job are you faithful in your work before he's going to give you a lot of job you better show that you can be faithful in the little bit there's one more you cannot serve both God and money it's just not going to happen oh I can do that no you can't Bible tells you, you can't do it, so don't try to argue with God's word, okay? Now, I'm not saying in that statement, and I don't think Jesus is saying in that statement, that if you're wealthy, you have somehow failed in your walk with God. That's not the point. The point is, what are you give, using your money for? Is it to advance yourself, your own selfishness, or are you being shrewd with your money by using it to help other people um, doing that sort of stuff. You all remember King Solomon? I don't think anybody knew him personally here today. But King Solomon became king when, when David died. Okay, And you'll recall that Sol God asked Solomon, what do you want me to do for you? And Solomon says, God, help me have the wisdom to govern these people that are yours. And God was so happy with that response that not only did he make Solomon the wisest man who ever lived, but he also poured out great riches, great power, great, um, I don't want to say popularity, but everybody knew about him, okay? But then Solomon ran into a, tr ran into a problem. One by one, nations around the world wanted to have a treaty with Israel because of Solomon's wisdom. And the way you did that in those days was you sent your daughter to be married to the king. Um, polygamy was um, acceptable in those days. And it says that Solomon had, what was it, 700 wives and 300 concubines, or, which basically means he had 1,000 mother-in-laws. So you just go figure that one out on your own. But every one of these girls began to lead Solomon towards their home God. And I can hear the conversation, you know, Solomon, you know, I love you, but I really would like a place to worship myself. Would you mind building me a little temple? Doesn't have to be fancy, just, you know, 
put it over there and let me worship it you know, according to my people's ways. Solomon did that. And slowly, one by one, these ladies that he has received as br you know, brides began to lead him away from the one true living God. And that's why the kingdom was divided under his son, Rehoboam. You see, Re Solomon started out well, but he ended poorly. The fourth way this dishonest manager is an example for us is the fact that he acted immediately. He didn't wait. Now's the time to do these things, friends. The dishonest manager may have been thinking more about what he would eat or where he would sleep than anything else, but he chose to act immediately according to this parable. And that's an important point for us. Don't wait till tomorrow to get right with God. Get right with him now. Don't wait till next week to start serving him. Start serving him now. You may not know this name, but Frederick Fleet was on duty the night of April the 15th, 1912. And his job was pretty simple. He was up in the crow's nest of his ship, and his job was simply to watch ahead of the ship for icebergs. And he saw one. And he signaled the alarm. But it was too late. The HMS Titanic hit the iceberg. And you know the rest of the story. Inside that ship, Prior to them hitting the iceberg, the men and women, boys and girls, were some were sleeping, some were eating, some were playing cards, others were talking among passengers, some were listening to the orchestra. They were doing what was normal for a cruise until they hit the iceberg. They weren't prepared. They weren't ready. They didn't make any plans. And when that moment hit, it was too late for most of them. You may not be expecting to enter into heaven today, but are you ready to? You may not be expecting to give an account of your life but if you did, would it be a, an account that would please God? Are you ready? Are you ready to meet with God today? Or are you not? It's really just that simple. The consequences of our decisions are of eternal consequence. Be shrewd, be wise, and be ready.